I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Oops! The Podcast. I, as always, am Julio Gallarati, joined by my good friend, Francis Ellis. How are you, How are you, buddy? Man, I'm happy to be talking to you again. It's the bright spot of my day. I know. I know. Same here, dude. How are how you feeling? You got dude, a haircut. I think, uh, thanks for noticing. You did, but so did I. You got another one? Well, I got a real one. Oh, wow. Yeah, so did I. I got a real one. Oh. I got some super, super cuts, though, dude. And like Ew. my sideburns are kind of fucked up. They're like not the same. Super cuts is like the, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's so shitty, right? Yeah. It's the yeah, Taco it's Bell of haircuts. Yeah, truly. That's a good comparison. Um, Why did you go to Supercuts? What happened in your life recently that forced you to do that? <laughs> so I was visiting my parents uh, in Connecticut and they, where they live, they don't have like n- good places to get your haircut. As far, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do actually, but they just don't go to anywhere special. Um, not that I need somewhere special, but I was in a rush. And to be honest, I trust Supercuts more than I trust like Joe the Barber. Uh huh. Okay. Like, I don't need that. Like, I don't need like a man's man guy cutting my hair and like getting mad at me when I ask him to do something. You know what I mean? I wanted. You you don't need uh, Confederate flags in your barber shop to feel like you're gonna get a good haircut. Well, I I don't know if that's what I meant, but. <laughs> well, you know what, Julia? That's why I'm here to put words in your mouth. I Thank know you. what you mean. Um, <laughs> but I need. I like having a woman cut my hair. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you disagree? Because Ricky, who I'm actually staying with right now in Florida, we'll, we'll get to that. Holy um, shit. Ricky won't let a woman touch his head. And I don't like when men cut my hair. That's a great question. Uh, I'm honestly, I had a woman cut my hair the other day or yesterday. But my, in the past, my barber of choice has been this Russian guy named Sasha. Ah, uh, and Sasha has done time in Rikers and uh, is incredibly informed about the uh, political sort of brinksmanship of Russia and how Vladimir Putin came to power and his killing of the oligarchs, which led, led me to read the book. Um, oh, the one that you were just reading. From Russia with Blood, which I've gone back to now that I've finished the great uh, the end of October book this one is really good i mean let me tell you something vladimir putin whew, I know. that guy does not give a fuck i know i know it's crazy dude dude you know how we talk about like conspiracy theories in america and some people say you know hillary clinton did this or epstein didn't kill himself and it was covered up and like we have these conspiracy theories that people love to traffic in mm. vladimir putin has committed many conspiracy theories totally that are like that are real like he he killed 300 people in chechnya 300 of his own citizens oh is that the movie theater i don't i don't think no it was like separate bombings yeah there's so many of those stories it's insane and they and he killed his own citizens to to then pin it on like separatists and anti-government cells to right. try to uh, bolster his his platform and then he and he clamped down on the guys that he was pinning the terrorism on and then was seen as like a politician who had cleansed the country all oh, right i know i know exactly what you're talking about the apartment building yeah i think that's what yeah. it was and then totally. like right after that people saw fsb which is the new kgb they saw them planting bombs with the, that were made of the same right. exact chemical makeup as the ones that had been found to have killed all these people. And these eyewitnesses saw them doing it. And the FSB claimed that it was like a training exercise to see if anyone would like catch them. <laughs> yeah, dude, so preposterous. And, and, and meanwhile, 
I know I'm just kind of summarizing the book, but it, I mean, it's so good. Meanwhile, these ousted oligarchs who are the massive wealth holders of, of Russia, um, and the lead guy was this guy, Berezovsky. They'd all been- Bor- they, Boris. Yeah, Boris. They'd fled to England. And, you know, he's buying up all these castles in England. But his sole goal at this point, this was in the early 2000s, right after Putin had come to power, and Berezovsky had backed him. Um, but then Putin cut off his, like, trust fund from the state, basically, because mm-hmm. he was siphoning funds away from the country. and. When he did that, Berezovsky turned on him and made it his mission to, uh, to reveal what Putin had done to come to power. And he put out like a documentary and a book and all these things. And I mean, I know where this is going. I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm, I'm, I know yeah. that Putin ends up killing Berezovsky. He spent a lot of time in New York too, Berezovsky. Yeah, he was, he's a very rich dude. And dude, they go to like nightclubs and drop, you know, 100 Gs and... I mean, the wealth right. is just insane. So is, that, is he the main focus of that book? Do they talk about Khodorkovsky too? Yeah, Khodorkovsky, Paterasvili, um, and then Scott Young, who was like the fixer, the handsome fixer who ran around, you know, London and, and Chelsea and Soho in London and uh, was just like slinging money everywhere. Um, it's fascinating, dude. I mean, cool. the, the shell companies they set up, all of that. It's it's a really exciting and incredibly well written book. But it also it also makes me wonder. Like the, the the woman who wrote it is a woman named Heidi Blake, and she had written the original story for BuzzFeed News, and then she expanded that into a book. And I have to wonder that when she was writing this book, was she fearful? for her life like probably do you know what i mean like when you're yeah. writing about a topic that has resulted in other people everyone else who's talked about this topic every russian person admittedly has basically been killed for talking about it if you're if you're becoming the author and the face behind this story how scared are you Right, right. I mean, probably very scared, dude. Or, or at least you, you know that you got to be careful. I think, to me, journalists who write about stuff like this are basically like the, the wingsuit flyers of journalism. Right, look at Khashoggi, man. That was a good example that we were talking about before, the, the Saudi right. guy who's writing for the Washington Post. That whole thing, they completely botched that operation of chopping him up. Right. Getting away with it. I, I just have to wonder if, as a journalist, your desire to get the truth out there is so great that you're willing to put your life on the line for it. Right. No, dude, I know. It's fucked up. I mean, it's impressive. But at the same time, how much of it is also like, all right, well, are they chasing like Pulitzers? Are they chasing book sales? Oh, right. You know, what's the balance there? How How... How moral is it? Not moral, but like how um, how much in, yeah how how much integrity, journalistic integrity, is driving the right. need to get this story out? Versus I'm sure quite a bit, man, because the people need to know the truth, you know. Yeah. And I think if you do a good job at delivering the truth it, under crazy circumstances like that, you get rewarded and you get the notoriety as well, you know. It'd be pretty cool to win a Pulitzer. That would be fucking cool, dude. Yeah, the name of the book is From Russia with Blood written by Heidi Blake. It's about the Kremlin's assassination program uh, and how Vladimir Putin basically went after all the rich Russian dudes who had left the country after the fall of the, the Soviet Union. But, but the, connection is the, the connection between all of them is that they all were opposing him. If you like, were willing to play the game and like stay out of politics, like you get to keep rocking. And you know who, you know who was the big guy who played the game? Abramovich? Roman Abramovich, who yeah. owns Chelsea. Totally. And one of the reasons that he was so well-liked by Putin was that in Putin's early rise, when he was like the mayor or deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, uh, Abramovich bought him like a $500 million yacht. 
<laughs> Dude, Roman Abramovich used to give yachts out like they were flower bouquets. That's so Like insane. they were edible arrangements. <laughs> that was his gift of choice. Crazy, dude. Can you imagine? It's unbelievable. Dude, I watched a great, uh, I watched a shit ton of PBS Frontline during the first part of this coronavirus. And it's just nice. like one of the best shows. Like they have great investigative journalism. Yeah. And uh, there's a good Putin episode. It's a two part. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's good. And I read, there's one part where they talk about when Bill Clinton met him. Yes. He was like, this guy's no good. Like this is a problem. Really? Yeah, and this is right when Yeltsin kind of like handed off power to, to Putin. And yes, but, okay, he sorry, said, keep And he said to Yeltsin, he's like, that was a mistake. And I think if they say on Yeltsin's deathbed, like he had mentioned that maybe he had made a mistake by grooming Putin to be. But Yeltsin was falling apart. He was like a, right. no, he was a terrible alcoholic sure. and, you know, they basically knew they needed to get him out. But um, – in this book, it says, and, and maybe I haven't gotten to that yet, but Clinton and, and Tony Blair and then Bush, a lot of Western leaders welcomed Putin early on right? Uh, because he, was, he, he campaigned on a platform of effectively draining the swamp right. and, and ridding Russia of the corruption and the, uh, the incredible like wealth divide that was you know how the how the oligarchs were siphoning wealth from state-run right. assets right because yeltsin was just a weak he was weak because he was just too fucked up all the time yeah yeah exactly uh That's fascinating cool. book i would really recommend it people often ask us for book recs so, and i'm really enjoying this uh so give that a read yeah that's good it's a good topic man it's uh, yeah. a lot of good a lot of good drama you know what i mean it's much yeah. more interesting than western politics totally so speaking of wealth i have a great uh observation for you um, my girlfriend and I went to a brewery yesterday, right? And it had finally opened up its outer outdoor seating area. It was so great. Uh, we were, you know, sitting at picnic tables, drinking brews, uh, playing cribbage, having a nice time. <laughs> and I looked at another table near us and it was a family with like a dad, you know, I presume either his son or his son-in-law and then daughter or daughter-in-law. Uh, who were probably in their early 30s, about about my age, and then his wife. And this dad was wearing like a puffy vest, handsome looking dude, kind of looked like Chris Cuomo a little bit, you know, but but older. Mm -hmm. And he was wearing a wheels up hat. <laughs> Do you know what wheels up is? Does it mean that you fly planes? No, wheels up is one of those private jet rideshare services oh gotcha like net jets gotcha um where basically you like can almost uber private jet right you but buy think, like you buy a 10 pack yeah and it, it may be that you you know you have to pay a membership fee but there's always going to be an additional cost i mean it's it's not as if it makes private jet travel affordable i it, it, relatively speaking it does though it makes it less expensive than the other way of doing it Oh, cer certainly than, than owning your own jet and having right. two full-time staffed pilots and having the airplane hangar and the fuel costs and all of that. Right. It is much less expensive than that. Right. But, but, but still expensive. Still Obviously. really, really insanely expensive. But, right. dude, I don't think there is a level of douchebaggery that I could sink to where I would wear a wheels-up hat. <laughs> what if you own the company though? Oh. <laughs> That's like the only way that it's not douchey. All right, so there's one person in the world who can wear a wheels up hat because he started the company. Right, right. Or if you at I mean, the same time, that would be like the, the Uber CEO wearing an Uber hat. I I don't know. No, fair enough. And also if you work at the company, you can't you probably can't afford to take the flights, so you shouldn't be wearing the hat if you can't yes. afford it. So literally one guy who should be wearing it in the world. There's one guy that we could give, and, 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 and let's just assume by playing the numbers that this guy is not the dude who founded Wheels Up. Uh, yeah, okay. That basically means that he wants to wear a piece of clothing that lets everybody know that he flies private. Totally. And beyond that, though, it's the lowest tier of flying private. Right. No, totally. It you know what I mean? Is. Like he's not, he's not so rich that 
like like there are rich people that would look at him and be like really you fly wheels up that's fucking yeah dude, it's it's the timeshare of flying private yes exactly it's yeah. like it's it's a third floor apartment in a high rise in miami beach of <laughs> flying private <laughs> third floor not like 20th or 30th floor probably right. with canal views not beach views you know what i mean <laughs> totally uh Dude, so <laughs> I was looking at this guy and I just thinking like, okay, so so people who own private jets and are super baller, like yeah. $1 billion plus, they don't wear like, I'm a G5 owner. Totally. You know, Gulfstream, proud, proud Gulfstream daddy. Right. No, d- d- dude, absolutely. And it's because people, when you're a fucking billionaire, people know because there aren't yes. a ton of those. So my guess is that if this guy is a wheels up dude, he's probably in the like hundred million range, maybe a little north, maybe like a hundred between a hundred and two hundred million. You could, which, in theory, have less and be doing the and be taking wheels. Yeah, up. you probably could. You probably right, whatever. I mean, listen, I, I, yeah, it all okay. depends on your priorities, right? Agreed. Okay, let's assume he's in the hundred mil range, which is no slouch. It's no <laughs> slouch. If you if you're sitting on a hundred million dollars. Yeah, you you can fly. I guess you can fly wheels up. I do think that there are cheaper, there may be cheaper private air travel options than that. But I just thought it was the douchiest thing to wear a fucking wheels up hat. I really did. Dude, yeah, it's that's yeah, it's extraordinarily douchey. Well, how old is this guy? Yeah, probably 62, 65. Oh, sorry, you mentioned that already. Cuomo, older Cuomo situation. Older Cuomo, but handsome, like kind of dashing looking guy. Let's look at the pictures of the, uh, I'm looking at the picture of the wheels up. And the fact that we're just assuming, no, it's definitely not either of these two dudes. It's funny too, man. It's like when you're that age, that's the age where like you, you have just enough like juice left in your dick that you want to like impress girls. Totally. Like the, that like 60s age guy, those are the, that's like an age where you can still like score young chicks if you're rich enough. Yeah. Yeah, you know. he seemed he did seem pretty at peace with his family. Like they looked happy, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that he's, he's not taking the secret. Yes, yeah, taking secret wheels up trips to Aspen to see his twenty three year old <laughs> uh, au pair from Russia. You know, <laughs> are you a Mile High Club member? Not with another person by myself. Are you jerked it? Oh, many a time, many a time. Nice. Are you? No, um, but I, I one time could have probably executed it, and I was fighting with with the girl I was dating at the time, um, and we didn't pull it off, and it's a it's a regret for sure. I will one day join it though. Explain your process. Um, okay, where are you talking about the time where I missed how would out? You, how would you pull it off? Because it seems super okay. risky to me and okay, you totally. can get arrested for it. So this time, the time that I could have but didn't, I was on a private flight. And Oh, wow. But, but, but typically, you know, it's this girl's parents have the money. So we're always with her parents. But one time she flew from New York to her, to her college uh, in Rhode Island. And we wow. flew together on the plane and we were in a fight the entire time. It was like a 30 minute flight, but we totally could have mile hide it if we hadn't been fighting. And it's a bummer. And also do the other thing, like to her flying private wasn't that cool. So like if I was like, we should mile high, mile high club, like I would have looked like a fucking dork. You know what I mean? Like part yeah. of that was you have to act like you've been there before, even though you haven't, you know? Dude, let me say something. I don't care how many lottery tickets I win in my lifetime flying private will always be the coolest thing that I've ever experienced. And every single time I do it, I'm going to want a picture in front of the plane. Not necessarily, not necessarily to post on Instagram, but just to have, I, and, and sometimes I'll see people posting in front of their private jet on the airplane with their like buddies off to go somewhere. And for a split second, I think, oh, fuck these guys. Like that's totally. so act like you've been there. And then I'm like, no, don't act like you've been there. Flying private is Sick. fucking I incredible. I know. The, the I know. gulf between commercial air travel and I, I know I sound like a douchebag here, but let me just say this. I've never paid for private yeah. air travel. I've Dude, always okay. been a passenger. 
Totally. We can talk about it because it's a, it's a luxury to, it's not like we're doing it all the time. No, I've, I've flown, I've flown private, I think either three or four, yeah, four times. And three of those times with, was, was with the same friend whose dad owned a jet. And, and this, I mean, yeah. And that's the other thing you need to distinguish. The jet is the, is what we're talking about. Like if you and your family took a little plane from one Island in Jamaica to another, that's not like private. That doesn't count. Yeah. If you had turbulence, you didn't fly private. I mean, come on, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. If you didn't have a sashimi platter, you didn't fly private. <laughs> bring me my fruit salad and bring it right now. <laughs> that's what I, that, that's what flying private is all about. So, yeah, dude, flying private, flying private is the best thing ever. Yeah, but, it's crazy. It is you know, crazy. I also understand. I also think that like showing people that you've flown private in regular life with apparel is pathetic. Yeah, fair. Listen, man, this is it's it's a nuanced thing. It's the nuanced game bragging about private flying. Totally. <laughs> well, dude, totally. let me ask you. So you you asked this question earlier in this discussion. How would one pull off the Mile High Club on a public flight? Yes. Do you so, have an answer to that? The only thing that I can think of is pretending that you're taking your sick girlfriend to the bathroom. Uh, I've, I've thought that same thing. I've thought that absolutely. But then I think everybody probably thinks that and everybody probably immediately knows what the people are doing. But at the same time, like who's like making up this intricate lie to bang their girlfriend in the bathroom? Like, well, I don't know. Well, you're right. Okay, so there's two ways to go about it, right? Let's either you're just a total cowboy and you go in there together and hope that you know they don't see you, right? And I've right. heard. I, by the way, I've read like Reddit forums on this, and <laughs> apparently, you know, a European overnight flight, everyone goes to sleep. That's the, the flight time. attendants have kind of settled in to play gem drop or candy crush for a few <laughs> hours and you're you that's when you go and it's coast is clear you're you should be okay i don't know that's one thought the other thought is to <laughs> to try to, to cover your tracks and, and get ahead of it by saying yeah my girlfriend is really sick or she's having a panic attack i'm just going to go into this two foot by three foot bathroom to help her with her claustrophobia by adding another person into this terribly small room. Right. I, it don't. seems like you could easily get away with it. And dude, like, cause that's the thing. There's no, like, there's no sign that has two people fucking with a line through it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like the, well, rules here's the other thing. Clear. Here's the other thing I always do. Whenever I walk into an airplane bathroom, I size it up and I think how many positions would be available to us in here? Yeah. Only there's like one standing doggy. Yeah, standing doggy is the only one. The only one. Because anything other than that, and you're basically either putting like a foot in the toilet or her head in the toilet. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be lifting her up like a goddamn porn star, you know, bicep <laughs> curling her body. So uh, it's, it's standing doggy, which isn't even a position I like. You're basically going in there to say you joined the Mile High Club. At right. this point in my life, it's not a club that I really need to be a part of. I'd much totally. rather be part of the Wheels Up Club. So <laughs> that's my standpoint on that whole thing. Yeah, that's fair. I'd still like to do it just to do it. Um, okay. Yeah. But I feel you. It's not a high priority. Yeah. Yeah. You know? so. And then, okay, so here's a question. How do you, if you've gone under gone into the bathroom under the pretense that your girlfriend was sick and you're looking after her how do you exit the bathroom um okay well this is well that's a th there's a couple ways you could do that first of all you could notify the flight attendant as you're going into the bathroom and be like she's sick like you said to get ahead of it or yeah. you could just both go in and then you, the guy, as the guy you exit first, if there's anybody else waiting, you explain to them that she's not feeling well. Mm -hmm. If there's nobody waiting, you just walk back to your seat and then you let her finish up and then she goes. But if, my question is, if there's a flight attendant out there checking up on you, suspicious, do you say, she's doing a little better now, she just needs a little more time? Or Definitely. do you say, and then, and then does your girlfriend like, work herself up to look like she's been crying how far do you go with the ruse you, you at that point once you've gotten away with it who fucking cares she could be she could be perfectly healthy 
And if the flight attendant's like, oh, that was a quick turnaround, you'd be like, yeah, it was, it's a miracle. Or you're like, don't you insult me like that. Quick turn, <laughs> what the fuck? Seven minutes, you know? I'm a Sky Miles member. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, dude, my allergies just kicked in. My eyes yeah. are so itchy. Ugh. Same, same, it's crazy. Um, dude, so I was in, yeah, everybody, sorry to everybody dealing with these allergies right now. Um, I was in Connecticut for a few days. Yeah. My parents. Yeah. Um, Bring us up they, to speed on the life and times of Julio. Well, dude, this is good stuff. All right. So first of all, it's, I want to paint the picture of the town that we live where we're from. It's called uh, Haddam. Higginham is the town technically, but it's like part of this town, Haddam. Small town. Okay. Um, and it's, it's very rural. To the point where like I've realized that any friends of mine who like grew up in suburban communities or from the city, they may never encounter a town like this in their life. So rural, small mm-hmm. town, perfectly nice, like pretty middle of the road town. Um, but I went and stayed with my parents and my girlfriend had to work. So we have one kind of like room that's conducive with that in the house, the study, right? So we, we kind of cleared it before we're like Hillary needs the study. She needs to work in the study, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's like, okay, great, great, no worries. And we're like, she has to be in there the whole day. Are you guys sure? Yeah, no, it's fine, totally fine. So she had an 8.30 a.m. work call. The first day we're there. The first day we're there. 8.30 a.m., she goes in the office. She starts talking. I'm not kidding you. Less than 10 minutes into the call, my dad enters the room shirtless with a towel over <laughs> his shoulder and is just going through his stuff while Hillary is trying to sell to sell shit she's in a business meeting <laughs> selling things. yeah and she's like so yeah this is what we can deliver like doing her whole spiel and a nude man walks behind her like you couldn't see his <laughs> lower half of his body to see he had pants on either so for all you know this man is completely naked fresh out of the shower just bumbling around and i was like dad what the fuck are you doing she immediately just had to mute like she's like oh i'm gonna go ahead and uh turn this turn off the camera for a second like trying to like <laughs> And just like, what a, what a tough, I felt so bad for her. She texted me. She's like, your dad just walked in. And, and like, she was trying to be cool yeah. about it. So then we had to put yeah. a sign on the door that was like, do not enter. You know, it's funny though, dude. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people in business are like, that's so, that's happened so much lately right. that it's the new kind of new thing, like, right? I brought my baby to work and I'm breastfeeding. Don't act weird about it. You know totally. what I mean? Totally. Um, and it's funny because as we talk about transitioning to, to so many people potentially working from home, that will always be the occupational hazard. Definitely. Did you, speaking of Chris Cuomo, did you see the, the clip of him in his wife's yoga Instagram story in the background? He's just butt naked. <laughs> and it was up no for like way. a few minutes and then she, they saw it and took it down. Butt naked? Completely naked, but but facing away. So it's only his incredibly ass. ripped back and ass. That guy, dude, is he taking human growth hormone? Like, how no, is he he's, so shredded? He's an avid CrossFitter. He's like, he, he's one of those people who wakes up at three in the morning. You know? <sighs> Fuck, man. How, like, I mean, dude, you look great, bro. Like, you have a great. Thank body. you. I, well, it's so sweet <laughs> of you. That's so sweet of you. But let me tell you something, dude. There's a difference between being really like toned and fit. And being super jacked. And, and what, I think... And what, what do you consider yourself? Dude, I'm not... Nobody would look at me and be like, that's a beefy, like, super muscular dude. Okay, but you think Chris Cuomo is that? Yeah, he's yeah. big. Yeah. And let me tell you something. Chris D'Elia talked about this on his podcast. There have been periods in my life where I have had a personal trainer that I was seeing like three or four days a week very structured, disciplined, heavy weightlifting workouts. Right. Totally changed my diet, went very high protein, like complex carbohydrates, cutting out sugar, went, went full Navy SEAL for a period of like six months. Kind of the amount of time that you would need to like prep to play a Marvel superhero, right? <laughs> and when, when was this in your life? This was when I was working at Barstool. And so a couple years ago? Yeah, probably like 2000, se- mid-2017 to- You were to seeing a trainer four times a week? Three times a week, but then I was like doing my own workout based on what he'd given me another time of the week. And then I was doing like cardio twice a week. I mean, I was- it was by far the strongest and most in shape that I've ever been. Right. 
more than college when I was playing lacrosse, more than any of that. And I weighed, I went up right now. I weigh about like 204 pounds and I was 218 at that point. And just fucking shred. Yeah, I was, I was huge. My clothes like didn't really fit that well. Right. But, Did you like it? No. Well, let me say, let me I say prefer, this. I think you're cuter right now. <laughs> <laughs> I personally prefer your current body. Just so you know. So, so, so do I. And I think it's because <laughs> I just feel a lot healthier. And like, you know, shit hurts when you're lifting that much. Like your joints start to hurt. Yeah. But let good. me tell you this, dude. I did not look anything like a Marvel superhero. I didn't look like Kamel Nanjiani. I didn't look like Hugh Jackman. I didn't look like Bradley Cooper in uh, American Sniper. I, and, and Chris D'Elia basically just says, all these guys are on steroids. Right. And I think that's, that must be true. Because if I, I, I just looked bigger kind of all around, but nobody would have been like, whoa, that dude's huge. That dude's right. super jacked. Um, right. And, and, they, I don't, and they do it so fast, bro. Yes, yes. Like all of a sudden, they're just absolutely ripped. They have veins b- bursting from everywhere. And it's like, how the fuck do you do that? And, and I, just, I just think, unless you're willing to do steroids, because I was eating so much more protein, I was following it, I was so disciplined. And it, How many it, grams like, a day? Were you eating like 250 grams of protein? Dude, I'd today? wake up and I would eat like three eggs with some smoked salmon and then it like with, with some sweet potatoes. And then it, it like I'd have an 11 a.m. meal and then I'd have like a 3 p.m. meal and then I'd have a 7 p.m. dinner. I mean, it was so much chicken, so much fish. Right. And, and I put on 14 or 15 pounds of muscle, which is a lot. It's a lot. That's so much when you're not putting on any fat. But right. I still was not i don't think people would have said i was jacked right and so it just makes me realize chasing that like superhero body's bullshit unless you're willing to like cut fucking corners do do steroids or have a personal trainer who was appointed by the studio to watch everything you do and right. force feed you know vitamixed protein down your throat like you're like you're a goose being right. made for foie gras <laughs> dude i know one guy who he did when i was on that prank show um he did an episode and this guy was absolutely fucking shredded and he would tell me he would he would eat smoothies he would only eat one actual meal a day he would have a smoothie for breakfast smoothie for dinner eat a normal lunch and the smoothie was like all natural like da 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 and that he had lived like that for like seven years okay but was he was he like big no he wasn't like gigantic, but super he was just cut. super cut, but also like, I'll send you this guy. I'll, you'll be yeah, like, you'll send, be me, send me his body. I'd like to see. I, I really enjoy that. <laughs> now listen to me. I, I'm also going to say this, dude. Maddie A07 is this guy's Instagram, by the way, if anybody else is interested. I'm going to look him up right now. By the way, I have to say this. I love dudes with good bodies. <laughs> like I, I will stare at a guy with a great body. It, it makes me very happy. I don't know why. I mean, dude, look, it's good to see a good a good bod, dude. It's nice to see a good bod. I'll tell you this, man. I worked out so hard for two and a half months. I had a trainer writing my stuff and writing my diet, and my body like barely changed. Like I'm, and I was really good, dude. I didn't mm. drink at all. I was really disciplined, and like. I probably shed maybe 3% body fat, but like it was so much work and barely anything happened. And I'm just kind of like, what the fuck was it? Like, what am I doing? Yeah. Dude, it, it, you know, you have to decide what your goal is. I, I find that I do just feel better when I'm eating cleaner food. Oh, dude, like, for sure. It just makes your brain work so much better. I feel the happy day better. after, yeah, the day after I eat a meal of like fish and vegetables for dinner versus the day after I eat a pizza, objectively, that I, I'm I'm in a better shape after the fish, Definitely. but dude, this guy Matty Matty O seven, he's I wouldn't say he he's like a cut, almost like soccer player type body. Right. Okay. He's okay. not huge. Okay. I wouldn't say that he's huge. With he's clothes just- on, yeah. With clothes on, like I would think, oh yeah, that guy works out. But I wouldn't be like that dude is preparing for war. What do you think about his cue pick for May 17th? 
<laughs> this cute pick from May. Okay, hold on. Let me go back. Wow, it's he's like got four. a lot of really cute picks. Okay, <laughs> so like I don't love that, and I think it's his puffy nipples. Like I, I'm a big right. nipple snob, you know. Mm. Um, I I really care a lot about the nipples, and if you look, our right nipple, his actual left nipple, is too puffy for me. <laughs> the other one's you fine. It a little bit. Yeah, it's just it just makes me think like you know hugging him would would he'd poke you and i don't want that so dude what so you but you, do you have you don't have puffy nipples right no i so i have puffy nipples dude i know and i gave you shit for you at one time and it, it's the regret of my time podcasting with you <laughs> i felt so bad about saying that afterwards <laughs> such because you were just like i got nothing and then i was like no <laughs> tell well, me i, I suck <laughs> it doesn't bother me that much and i don't think it's like I mean, unless there's something I'm missing, because it's funny today. So I noticed somebody else posted something about puffy nipples, like on Instagram, one of my friends, and I'm just like, is that like really a thing that matters? Like, I've never like felt self conscious about it. It's it's not. I would say that this dude, it, honestly, puffy's not really the right word. These are pokey nipples. No, no. But also, I don't want you. I don't know. I don't want you to think that I am offended by proxy that you're making fun of this guy's puffy nipples. I don't care. Your, but, your nipples are better than this guy's nipples. This guy's nipples look like he's true. ready to breastfeed. My nipples are not better than this guy's nipples, I don't think. Well, But, this, but whatever. You, fight, okay. you do what you can. So, yeah. <laughs> so my point being, all right, we're talking a lot about male bodies. I, I love a guy with a good body. I stare. <laughs> and, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, I would have been insecure about my, my sexual orientation based on those uh those lingering looks that i would cast at, at men with good bodies but <laughs> let me tell you something dude on friday i went out on a boat with some old friends of mine from maine kids that i went to high school with right mm -hmm. and they've stayed here they've lived in maine they have a great life they have a boat they go out fishing they awesome. get fucked up you know they got into cocaine late Oh, so what? they're still really enjoying that. And even at like 31, <laughs> they'll have a bonfire and just spe they'll just stay up all night talking. It always blows my mind. Which sounds like my nightmare, but Same. That they're, that's where they are at. And we're out on the boat. My girlfriend's there. One of them has their girlfriend and they're, they've been drinking since like noon. And a couple interesting things happened. One of them used the word fag. Oh, and, like and, in casual conversation, just like called me or another guy a fag, but with no, no gay, uh, it wasn't, there was nothing malicious in terms of a gay sense. It was just using that word lazily. And my girlfriend and I like both stopped and we were like, what did you say? And he was like, <laughs> oh, are, are you guys not cool with that? <laughs> and I was so I hadn't heard that word used that lazily in so many years. Right. That I was just like, dude, who talks like that anymore? Totally. And I, I wasn't even trying to like virtue signal or call him out or teach him the error of his ways. It was as if someone had walked out of a changing room closet wearing a 1980s outfit and being like, this is totally. sick, right, guys? Totally, totally. And, I, and I, wanted to be, I was just like, wh wh what time warp did you just enter from? Totally, dude, 100%. And then we continued, you know, to putter around these islands. One of them finished a bottle of, like, plastic Jim Beam oh, and Jesus. then just threw it into the ocean. Oh, God. Jesus. Just dude. littered. Trailblazing, these guys. And that was when I was like... I didn't know people like this existed anymore. Right. And, and I know that's a, an ignorant thing to say. And it's the very reason why people are surprised by certain political outcomes or, you know, whatever. But I just like, I hadn't seen someone discard trash into the ocean like that. Right. Especially with so like long. where we're at with like the turtles and the straws and like, you know, it's not a good look to be doing that in front of people you aren't super close to. Exactly. Now, I wouldn't, do that. I wouldn't do that to begin with, but if I were going to do something off color, 
I wouldn't do it in front of an audience that whose whose reaction I couldn't anticipate. That is exactly correct. Yeah. The fact that you to, to be that comfortable around uh, uh, people that you don't know that well, and to just assume that everyone is on board. Yeah. Big it's. Mistake. I don't know. It's like it's like dropping hate speech or or having a very specific conspiracy theory that you assume everyone's on board with. Totally. Fucking, I, I was I was aghast. I said to him, I was like, dude, you could have just given that to me. I would have taken care of it for you. And he's like, I know, I'm sorry, I'm white trash, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the water was like cold, and we, I, 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 that we we were ripping at that point. And so it was like. I couldn't get the captain to stop the boat and turn around. We were going full speed. Jesus. And it has like, it's haunted me that that bottle is just floating around out there. That's good. dude. You're a good guy. I mean that dude. I, yeah. That's unacceptable behavior at this point. Like, what are you doing, dude? Especially in front of other people. Like what a, bo- what a bozo. What like, a bozo. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, he's drunk, getting too comfy. Like, at that point, so, so the guy driving the boat was a guy that they had hired or was this one of the people who had been committing these social crimes? The, the, driver, the driver is a friend of mine. They're all like, the driver is the guy I'm closest to and he wasn't the one committing the social faux pas. But <laughs> um, the other, you know, I don't think that this would have been very weird to the driver either. Right, 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 right. Dude, I mean, just, at that point, I would start getting nervous for my safety in the boat. Because like people who are just that much of a wild card, like yeah, I would just start like if especially if I was a little high, like I would just be really like overthinking the moment and just be like really stressed out. Well, it yes, it 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 made me realize that uh, obviously parts of the country evolve at different speeds. People evolve at different speeds, and that isn't to say that these guys will ever get on board with not throwing their shit into the ocean, but. Other things, I mean, <laughs> other things that were that stood out to me as being different. They were talking about wanting to bring me bear hunting in September, hunting black bears. And, you know, these guys, by the way, these guys have AR-15s. Oh, shit. They have lots of guns. But it's Maine. It's Maine. But, you know, I just, I guess I AR-15, even, even I grew AR-15s. up in a bubble in Maine. Dude, owning an AR-15 is a different speed. It, that's a crazy... Yeah. I shot one of those at a gun range in Nashville. It is the loudest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, it, it was uncomfortably loud. It shook my brain. I'm sure. I'm and sure. even compared to like the heavy handguns and the machine gun and the shotgun. Have you, sh- yeah. you shot all of that? You shot all of that. Wow. And it was like, I didn't, I wasn't turned on the way some people are, but I was glad to have done the experience. Totally. totally. But the AR-15 stood out as a truly insanely loud, offensively loud, violently loud machine. Right. Um, so anyway, they're talking about bringing me bear hunting and they're like, yeah, we drive up four hours on logging roads up to the Northern Maine, no cell <laughs> service. You know, we got the dogs. <laughs> They, Dude, they why, are they, the, why are they Australian? I don't know how to do that. I was doing the main accent. They're like, yeah, buddy, you know, you, 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 get, you bring the dogs up there, and they, they, they smell them, and they chase, they hunt the bear, they run them up into a tree, and then you Is just- Is it like boom. Bostonian, kind of? It's close to Bostonian. I got yeah, better at it. Yeah, take them up to the fucking woods. Yeah, dude. yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, you, you get them up in the tree, yeah, and you shoot them, right? And boy, he falls out of the tree like a sack of potatoes, and then right at the ground, you put <laughs> another one. You put another one right in his brain. Oh, God. And then they, like, bring him to this guy who curates the, the whole thing. Like a taxidermist? He, yeah, yeah. And he hangs him up in his garage on a hook and then takes a machete and slits up. And they're explaining this to me as I'm, like, sipping a craft beer on the boat, enjoying the sunset. And they're like, the, the guts spill out all over the floor of his garage. And he's oh like, what do you want? Some, so you want some bear sausages? You want some, <laughs> you know, we can make back straps. We can make fillets. The heart is really tender. And I'm like, dude, you know, I'll happily buy some of this meat from you, but I am not coming on this trip. Right. Well, at least they, at least they, <laughs> that's about it, dude. At least they eat it. Exactly. Exactly. I have no problem with hunting. I really don't. I have no problem with hunting, but I just, I like patting animals so much that I don't think I could kill yeah, one. 
I like animals, dude. I, you know, I feel you on that. I, there's just, it, although, you know, um, it sounds, there's something cool about it. The idea of bear hunting, but yeah, I would probably pass also. Yeah. Um, but that's cool, dude. So all of that was the, the precursor to my Saturday night, which was when I got invited to go perform on a stand-up comedy show. The first one that I've done in three wow. months. Wow. How was that? Up in, also in Northern Maine. It was two hours Northwest of where we live. We live on the coast. And like, by the way, Southern Maine, Portland area is where most of the population of Maine lives. Portland's the biggest city. And then really the majority of the, I don't know, the, the people in Maine live along the coast, right? Ports, shipping, uh, fishing, all that. Everything seems to be along the coast. But if you get up into northwestern central Maine, it is, it's different, dude. Yeah. It's different. Every single house, I'm not kidding you, every house has a big Trump Pence sign oh, posted interesting. there. Interesting. Whereas southern Maine is very, very left leaning. Right, right. right. Um, and so it's all that. It's all trailer houses. Everyone has like these Can Am open air like off-roading vehicles that they drive down the streets. Crazy. Like dune buggies, basically. Um, everyone has a weapon. And we were performing at this. It was basically, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. It was a, it was like a right-wing militia uh, meeting place called the East End Brewing Company. And we go in there and we're perform we're supposed to perform out back there's a chicken coop with geese in it that was attached to the stage no way picnic tables a fire pit um now get this it starts raining so we have to stay inside right but everybody there all these people you know their job they all run grow operations of marijuana interesting and they've been doing it for tens of years so long before it was legal and now it's legal and now they've just been selling it dude one of these dudes told me i could buy a pound of weed from him for one thousand dollars that sounds that has to be an extremely good deal right i would say a normal pound of weed would run you anywhere from like 2600 to 3500 that's what you should expect to pay right for a little math really quickly, when I buy a half ounce of weed by a delivery guy in New York City, I pay 250 bucks. So a full ounce, roughly 500, let's call it, maybe a little less. There are 16 ounces in a pound. Right, right. Which would be 16 times 500 is, what, $8,000? This right, guy was but, willing to sell me a pound for $1,000. Well, here's the question, though. How, like, high-tech is his situation? Is it just, like, shitty He showed me pictures. Good? It looked like, uh, you know, oh, uh, really? a very modern machine that was culling wow. the buds off these huge rows of plants. Wow. Really good weed. And he said it's just that, like, back in the day, you know, in, in five years ago, he would have made $30,000 a month selling weed. And now he's lucky to make... 4,000 because as weed has become recreationally legal in Maine, uh, nobody, nobody cares anymore. It, right. The supply has outshot the demand already. Right. You had, so you had to have seen that coming. Yeah. That's a bummer. But dude, these guys, I mean, I'll tell you, pretty good audience. Not bad. Not bad. Like they were very involved with the jokes. Yeah. You'd tell a joke. And like, I would be like, you know, my sister's pregnant, which is a bummer because she told me we didn't need to use the condom. And they would be like, oh, buddy, yep, I've been there. Been there, big guy. You can't trust your sister. I don't care if you're family. <laughs> and I'm like doing these hacky incest jokes for them. And they're fucking slapping and then like slapping their knees and then telling the people they're come with like, oh, I banged my sister last week. It'll tell you why we had a bit of a scare, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, I don't know, man. All bets are off. Was doing stand-up weird? Like, was it hard? Did you, like, forget everything? You, you Like, how did you review to get prepared for it? Honestly, this was just me going up there and stretching. 
Right. It was just like a total, let's go for a light jog right. to, to get our feedback. I, I try to, I, I hadn't, I didn't even have the ability to try new stuff. Right. Um, they, these people just weren't willing to listen. It was such a weird slice of humanity to be performing for. Uh, so I'm not going to connect with these people by telling jokes about, you know, driving my dad's Tesla or like, you know, the, the irony was this town was called Cambridge, Maine and we're driving in there and I have all these, I'm writing all these jokes in my head about how like I've spent time in both Cambridge, England and Cambridge, Massachusetts, significant <laughs> time, but this is my favorite Cambridge, you know, and I know for a fact that these people, as soon as I got in there, that they don't, they don't know, they don't, they probably don't even know where Cambridge, Massachusetts is. Right, so right, right. I just dumped all that shit and like tried to do incest and gun jokes and I'm not very good at those. Hilarious. Yeah. Love it, dude. Uh, I don't know. So you're in Florida? Yeah, I'm in uh, Palm Beach. And, uh, Must be nice. <laughs> I've, we flew, which, and I was, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's the time of year that's normally not busy here, you know? So now right. I guess it's busier because of all this shit. Um, and, you know, it's, it, dude, it's, it's, it's a nice change of pace, staying with friends. Um, Ricky, who you guys, uh, listeners have probably remember he was on one of our episodes and, uh, just, you know, laying low for a couple of weeks and figuring it out, man. Love it. Did, did Hillary come, come down yeah, with you? Yes. Hillary's here too. Nice. Um, flying was like very chill. Yeah. Um, you know, not how, a ton of people. How, in the airport. how full was the plane? I mean, it wasn't full, but it wasn't not. I mean, there was definitely like the Aeroflot flights that I took during non pandemic times had fewer people on them. Yeah. Then, yeah. you know what I mean? Like these, there's probably 50 people on the flight. Um, on a plane that holds what? A hundred. I'm not, I'm well, there's no middle seat. So like no middle seat action happening, but like most of the rows had two people in them, two people in the aisle and the window, but nobody in any middle seats. Um, I see. And you know, I, I'm happy that I did it because you know, I'm, I would feel very comfortable flying elsewhere as well. Yeah, that's good to know. So, yeah, I think things that are, um, God, I never know what to say, but I, I'm hoping, uh, you, you see people inching back out of their shells in, in certain facets of life. And that's very encouraging. Totally. Um, should we wrap there? Let's, let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. You guys are the best. We've really enjoyed, uh, everything as always talking to you guys. Um, it's a pleasure. We have some fun reader e emails and submissions to talk about on the next episode, which we may do. Um, but for now, keep sending us your thoughts, your struggles, your experiences, especially any, send us some thoughts about, um, if you've had, got any mile high club tips for next yes. episode, we'll, we'll love, we'd love to hear that for now. I'm oops. Uh, I'm Francis Ellis. This is oops. The podcast. He's Julio Galrati. Uh, G any final thoughts? Um, no, everybody stay safe and uh, good luck out there.